Hi, welcome to our Distinguished Scholars presentation, the class of 2020. I am Karen Stewart, the director of the Distinguished Scholars Program, and I am so excited to be here, albeit little unusual circumstances. So tonight, our seniors are so excited to defend their thesis and give you uh, the culmination of their hard work for these last two years. So without further ado, I'm going to have Mia Martinez, class of 2021, give the opening prayer. Would you please pray with me? Dear God, thank you for today and thank you for the seniors and for guiding them in these past four years and through their journey in DSP. And I pray that you continue to guide them and all of us in our daily lives. And I pray that you keep us safe always, but especially now during um, this global crisis. And I pray that we remain focused on you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Mia. Now I'd like to turn it over to our Masters of Ceremonies for the evening, Christian Gwali. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Once again, my name is Christian Gwali. I'm a member of the Scholar Class of 2021, and I'm delighted to be your Master of Ceremonies for the evening. On behalf of the entire Distinguished Scholars Program, I'd like to thank you for being here tonight and for tuning in to watch our scholars present. So given all that, I'm gonna introduce our first scholar. First up tonight, we have Caitlin Moore. At Houston Christian, Caitlin is a project manager on our robotics team, and she's also the captain on our track and field team. Caitlin is also a D group leader and is involved in our award-winning theater tech for our musical. Next year, Caitlin will be attending the College of Engineering at Texas A&M University. And in fact, Caitlin is the only scholar of the four tonight whose popularity and personality will not determine how much income she'll make after college. I mean, she's just, she is trying to be an engineer after all. So without further ado, for the first scholar of tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Caitlin Moore. Hi, my name is Caitlin Moore, and I'm a member of the scholar class of 2020. Why am I here today? Why can I not just send you my paper? It'd be easier for me. Simple. I want you to remember what I have to say. And studies have shown, watching presentations helps solidify information in people's minds. This is also why mythology has been used to teach sociological and psychological lessons to society. Mythology has taught these lessons through hero stories, which are common variables such as the hero's journey and heroic archetypes. The hero's journey is a cycle of adventure nearly all heroes experience, and the heroic archetypes are key plot points or qualities most heroes or their stories have. But these heroic stories have not remained in the past. They have carried on to the modern age and be found in modern superhero comic books and films. This leads a scholar to ask, how has storytelling in Greek and Roman mythology influenced today's hero stories? And what impact does this mythology have on today's society, specifically in defining today's heroes in comic books and film? What impact does the modern hero have on today's economy? Given this, superheroes debuting in the 1940s continue to teach society. Sociological and psychological lessons have been used to teach societal norms and moral lessons and are still a vital part of heroes today. In fact, according to a 2018 study performed by Hope College, Virginia Commonwealth University, people who are shown images of heroes are more likely to take part in pro-social behavior. These lessons have been taught in many different genres over time, but hero stories remain a fan favorite. These mythical heroes and their stories can be seen as inspirations for the modern superheroes, as seen in the shift from Perseus to Superman, Heracles to Batman, and Atalanta to Wonder Woman, through the hero's journey and heroic archetypes. This continuity shows the importance of heroes over time, and the popularity and success of these ideas have also had a great impact on today's economy. Superheroes originally came about in comic books in 1939 with Superman and became popular 
because they're a way of escaping and feeling secure during World War II. From there, superheroes began to appear on serials and in TV shows, further providing jobs and supporting American superiority. Over time, the US film industry for heroes has risen and fallen. But as seen today, superheroes are still having a great impact on today's economy. In fact, the US film industry generated $43.4 billion in revenue in 2017. And hero movies account for the top eight movie franchises in America. As you can see, heroes still play an important role in both our society and our economy. To verify the research previously shown, I tested two null hypotheses and a comparative case study. The two nulls were tested through an online survey where respondents were members of the HC community, a majority of which were students. I first tested my first null hypothesis, which reads, the Houston Christian community prefers female superheroes. To test this null, I asked participants three questions. The first being, do you prefer female or male superheroes? To which the majority replied that they had no opinion, resulting in a p-value of approximately 0 .0005. Now, p-value is the probability of getting the same results if the null hypothesis were true. So the smaller the p-value, the more likely we are to reject the null hypothesis. I then asked respondents whether they would prefer Captain America or Wonder Woman, where I received a p-value of approximately 0 .0007, with most preferring Captain America. Finally, I asked if they preferred Robin or Batgirl, to which most replied that they preferred Robin, resulting in a p-value of approximately 0 .03. With p-values of less than 0 .05, I was able to reject my first null hypothesis that the Houston Christian community prefers female superheroes. I then tested my second null hypothesis, which reads, the Houston Christian community prefers perfect superheroes. I asked respondents whether they would like a perfect hero, and their responses showed an undeniable desire for imperfect heroes with a p-value of essentially zero. I also asked what their favorite hero's flaw was. And the most common hero's flaws listed included hubris and emotions. Given this information, I was able to reject my second null hypothesis that the Houston Christian community prefers perfect superheroes. I then conducted a comparative case study of the frequency of occurrences of heroic archetypes and components of the hero's journey in Marvel and DC films. The heroic variables chosen were familiar settings, being abandoned by parents, having a relatable ordinary world development, having personality flaws, and refusing the call to adventure. These were seen in the superhero movies Iron Man, Captain America, Captain Marvel, Elektra, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern. In total, Marvel had 13 occurrences of the heroic archetypes and components of the hero's journey, compared to DC 7. This shows Marvel movies stay truer to mythology's core structure than DC, which may be the reason behind Marvel's higher success rate in recent years. As you can see, the data gathered supports the research previously shown, leading one to recognize the true importance of heroes in our society. However, as all good research leads to more research, I was still curious about the importance and drive of real life heroes today, leading me to ask, what is the psychology of heroism and how do everyday people become heroes? So what makes a hero a hero? Well, the truth is, there's no true definition of what a hero is. Heroes change from one society to the next, and throughout time. Just like superheroes, 
Everyday heroes reflect a society's beliefs and values. However, according to the Heroic Imagination Project, a nonprofit organization focused on teaching individuals to be everyday heroes, heroism can be identified as containing four important qualities being voluntary and intentional, being a service to others, containing personal risk or cost, and not being motivated by recompense. These four qualities indicate a person has an altruism trait and emphasizes concern for others. The definition of altruism is an unselfish concern for others and a desire to help, not out of obligation due to duty, loyalty, or religious beliefs. However, in today's society, it can be hard to picture a person who helps others for no personal gain. But, according to a 2010 study at Georgetown University, everyone has some altruistic traits, unless they are psychotic or unstable. And so it can be seen that the question becomes, if we know altruism is a key factor to becoming a hero, how do we become more altruistic? Well, I'm glad you asked. The answer is, I don't know. Psychologists and philosophers have spent centuries trying to figure out why people help each other. Some believe it is a part of our genetics and that it comes from an instinctual need to protect our kin for our own livelihood, stemming back to when nomads had to rely on each other to survive. However, our society is becoming increasingly more altruistic. So there must be some way to become more altruistic. Unfortunately, we still have no idea how to do so. But altruism may not be the only problem for heroes. In the end, heroes are decided upon by society something few people have control over. There are two types of heroes in the world, personal and societal. Personal heroes usually take the form of parents, grandparents, friends, and teachers. They are people you have personal connections with, and they are also some of the most loved. Meanwhile, societal heroes have a much more difficult time. These heroes are turned into idols and placed on a pedestal by society. However, in doing this, society begins to lose its connection with the heroes because they are placed so far above everyone else. And in the end, society ends up turning on the heroes because of the pedestal that the heroes have been placed on by society. People will begin to point out the heroes' flaws and use them as a reason that the hero is not perfect. The problem is, people keep looking for this perfect hero that doesn't exist on Earth. To become a hero, you must rise above the circumstances and learn from your flaws. So to become a hero, you have to be imperfect. But then society expects you to be perfect, because that makes logical sense. It is the ultimate Wow, goose chase. But why does any of this matter? Why are heroes important? Just like the superheroes previously discussed, everyday heroes reflect a society's beliefs and values. You can tell a lot about a person based on who their hero is. True heroes are meant to go out into the world and inspire the next generation to do good. And they are important because the lives helped and saved through their heroic actions. Heroes are indispensable in a society because a quick and unhesitating reaction can mean the difference between life and death. And without heroes, our society would likely turn to chaos and war. And so it can be seen, whether they have superpowers or not, heroes play a vital role in defining our society. Tonight, the scholar discussed the impact of mythology on today's society, stories, and economy, the rejection of the knolls on the gender and profession of heroes, 
a comparative case study of Marvel and DC films and the definition, qualities, and importance of real life heroes today. After this, the scholar was also able to connect the research biblically to Luke 6.35. This verse discusses God's calling for us to love everyone and seek nothing in return. This definition of altruism reminds us to be selfless and heroes to those around us. Thank you, and are there any questions? All right, so for those who have questions, what we're gonna do is have whoever would like to ask our scholars a question, if you could please type that in the live stream chat box. We will receive your questions and comments live here in real time, and I will proceed to relay these questions to the scholars um, so they can hopefully provide some insight um, into what you have to ask. And for those who are unsure as specifically how to proceed uh, to type a question, so what you're first gonna need to do is you're gonna need to uh, click the escape button in the top left of your keyboard. Um, it's labeled ESC. And then you're gonna see the chat box with all the live comments on the right of the video. And then click on the line, say something, and then you can type in your question there. So, Caitlin, Cameron, yes. has, Cameron has asked, how has the heroic archetype as seen in pop culture and the film industry influenced humanity's willingness to appear brave in front of others? Well, that is a very good question, Cameron. I think we look to heroes, whether they're superheroes or not, and one of the main heroes we see is in the films because superhero films are so popular, and we usually like to imitate the people we see as heroes. So we see those heroes going out and doing all these brave actions. So then we ourselves want to imitate that and do brave actions. Thank you. Okay, Caitlin. Mr. Harmon has asked, what was your biggest surprise or unexpected result of your research? Very good question, Mr. Harmon. I think the most interesting part was going through my case study and choosing the heroic variables and looking at them as they're seen in today's DC and Marvel films. And I found that things that I thought would carry on through all the movies may not versus some things that you would think would still be there actually aren't there. And I found it very interesting. One of them was uh, whether heroes are abandoned by parents, which is a very common theme in the original myths. You only see them in a few of the stories today, even though other stories like the Disney movies have no parents. A lot of times the hero movies actually do have the parents present. All right, and then for the last question, Miss Welshheimer asked, who is your favorite superhero and why? Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure. Huh, Spider-Man. Definitely Spider-Man because he's awesome and he's a teenager and who doesn't love Tom Holland? I'm just saying. <laughs> all right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. All right, our next scholar to present is Isabella LeBlanc. At HC, Isabella is a senior representative on our student council, as well as the vice president of our Model United Nations Club. Outside of Houston Christian, Isabella is involved in restoring justice as a leader at Youth for Justice. In the fall, Isabella will be attending George Washington University to study something related to social justice. And since she couldn't pick Harry Styles as her topic tonight, she chose to present this instead. Look out for Isabella in the political realm or on the Supreme Court in the next 30 years, as I can assure you that she will be a major player in our country's future. Ladies and gentlemen, Isabella LeBlanc. Hi, my name is Isabella LeBlanc, and I'm a member of the Scholar Class of 2020. Happiness is best defined as the continual pursuit toward the fulfillment of one's true purpose. Now, some individuals define happiness as religion, health of relationships, or monetary success, though not all descriptors accurately measure one's level of satisfaction. In the fall, I examine the history of the search for self-actualization. 
beginning with Socrates and concluding with Dr. Abraham Maslow. Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, a diagram explaining human need and desire, is a foundational piece of positive psychology. Positive psychology is defined as the ability of an individual or community to ascend the hierarchy of needs. When looking at the impacting factors of positive psychology, I found that geography offered a wealth of data and decided to focus specifically on it. This led me to ask, what drives man's desire for self-actualization? And what is the role geography plays in the positive psychology movement, also known as the science of happiness? What impact does this science have on psychosocial and physical well-being as seen through relationships, income, and health? Physical geography most directly impacts a person's ability to access services, such as healthcare, clean water, and food. In developed countries, such as the United States, political geography impacts a citizen's environment through healthcare insurance, vocational training, and food security. When drafting possible null hypotheses, I examined a series of happiness-related research to better formulate my own investigation. In keeping with the World Happiness Index's standard, I hypothesized the following. Developed countries will be, on average, less happy than developing countries. A random internet generator was used to select Finland, Serbia, and El Salvador, and I pre-selected the United States. I then examined volunteer participation, GDP, average net income, and health indexes to order the countries from first to fourth. Volunteer participation was gauged by asking participants if they had engaged in any volunteer activities within the country in the last 60 days. GDP was calculated based on figures from the International Monetary Fund. Average net income figures were adapted from the 2018 World Bank report. And health indexes were adapted from the World Health Organization, but Serbia was not included in whose report. Health indexes refer to median life expectancy and the quantifiable factors which impact it. In the context of the null, first refers to the highest percentage of a metric, while fourth refers to the lowest. The nation scored the following averages. United States, 1.25, Finland, 1.75, Serbia, 3.3, and El Salvador, 3.5. As the two developed countries, the United States and Finland, retained higher scores than the two developing countries, Serbia and El Salvador, I can successfully reject my null hypothesis. For my second null, I decided to examine the saying, money doesn't buy happiness. In keeping with the precedent of multiple previous studies, I hypothesized the following. Houstonians in a lower socioeconomic bracket will be happier than those in a higher socioeconomic bracket. I created an anonymous electronic survey to collect data on demographics, including gender, race, age, marital status, federal income bracket, and political party. Further, I asked three questions regarding healthcare coverage and insurance to better understand respondents' access to medical care. After completing the demographics and healthcare portion, respondents completed the Satisfaction with Life Scale, a tool used by psychologists to score patient satisfaction from five, being extremely dissatisfied, to 35, being extremely satisfied. I took the average satisfaction with life, the majority of respondents to the survey were white women born in the years 1997 to 2015 and belonging to the Republican Party. I then took the, sat the average satisfaction with life scale score of the three highest and three lowest federal income brackets, which were 25.8 and 26.2 respectively. Because the scores are so similar, the null is retained. After concluding the null hypotheses, I examined a series of patient care related comparative case studies conducted by the National Cancer Institute in 2007. The emphasis upon qualitative data mirrored my own decision to conduct a comparative case study between Dr. Sean Aker and Dr. Abraham Maslow's theories on happiness and positive psychology. Maslow founded the field of positive psychology, notably with works including motivation and personality and toward a psychology of being. Dr. Aker, however, uses positive psychology in the workforce, typically in regards to employee satisfaction and productivity. Studied works include Before Happiness and The Happiness Advantage. While Dr. Aker's ideas are more recent, the majority apply best in a work environment or similar, while Dr. Maslow's ideas apply to human well-being and satisfaction in a more general context. Though both psychologists are well-versed in positive psychology, I concluded Dr. Maslow had a greater effect on the field than Dr. Aker. 
This conclusion was reached through deliberation of both 20th century and modern day positive psychology. After studying the practical implications of positive psychology in the field itself, the global community, and the working population surveyed in Houston, I elected to continue my studies in the form of a remaining question. When deciding upon a remaining question, the growing media presence surrounding the 2020 presidential election was intriguing. More specifically, former presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren's proposed wealth tax was a subject of the article studied. I was intrigued because the majority of opponents to the wealth tax would not themselves be taxed. Further, philanthropic efforts by billionaires Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos had been under public scrutiny, leading me to ask, what are the ethical ramifications of being a billionaire? And how does billionaire status create an environment for greater moral responsibility? The human mind can't easily comprehend the number 1 billion. To put it simply, 1 million seconds is 11.5 days, or just under two weeks. If we assumed 1 billion seconds had been completed today, the clock would have started on June 29, 1988. A billionaire is defined as a person whose wealth, comprised of assets, net worth, or other markers of economic standing, is valued at $1 billion or other monetary units. According to a 2017 Oxfam report, eight billionaires control as much wealth as the poorest half of humanity, or approximately 3.6 billion people. Ethics are applied in decisions between what can happen and what should happen. The should varies from person to person. Some cite feelings, religious beliefs, legality, or societal norms. As of 2019, the richest man in the world is Jeff Bezos, with a net worth valued at $109 billion. To better understand the amount of wealth Bezos has, one can proportion the CEO's net worth to the United States annual median net worth valued at $97,300. The average American spending $1 would be equivalent to Jeff Bezos spending $1.7 million. Philanthropy plays an important role in many American budgets. When calculating the amount of a donation, 10% of one's income is often cited as an acceptable amount to give, beginning as far back as the time Genesis 28, 20 through 22 was written, or approximately 4400 BC. If an average American were to give 10% of $97,300 to charity, it would come out to $9,730. For Jeff Bezos, it would be $10.9 billion. According to the 2018 Chronicle of Philanthropy, Jeff and Mackenzie Bezos donated $2 billion to philanthropic causes. Other wealthy Americans, such as Michael Bloomberg and Mark Zuckerberg, gave $767 million and $213.6 million, respectively. If billionaires are theoretically beholden to the same 10% as the average American, the majority of the wealthiest have failed to do so. A theoretical obligation to philanthropy stems from the concept of moral responsibility. Moral responsibility then rests on free will. If a person is free to choose one course of action over another, one is then responsible for the consequences of said course. People who believe in libertarianism posit human beings act in free will when actions are informed by reason. Therefore, a child spilling food on the floor would not be morally responsible for the food because reason was not involved in the action. It's important to note libertarianism refers to the moral weight of a person's choices and not to the economic or political theory. Attributionists believe a person's actions, beliefs, and or character traits display moral character and sensitivity to moral responsibility. While sensitivity to reason is subject to the individual, almost everyone can donate income. Not everyone can start a nonprofit or run a food bank, but almost everyone can give something. And for the richest people on earth, the amount of income eligible for donation is in the billions. Large donations can stimulate entire communities, cities, and even industries. On April 3rd, 6.6 .6 million Americans filed for unemployment as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. If Michael Bloomberg, Mark Zuckerberg, and Jeff Bezos pooled their net worth and distributed equal amounts to every American filing, each person would get $273 million, including the three billionaires. Further, many billionaires are the respective founders or CEOs of their companies 
meaning that while they began the company, the current success of it is not theirs alone. Further, a business which generates enough money to generate a million or billion dollar CEO salary cannot reasonably be run by one person. It's possible the success of companies such as Amazon, Facebook, or Twitter can be attributed to not only the CEO, but the employee population. I sought out to understand the mechanisms by which geography affects happiness. I seen through relationships, income, and health. Based on numerous related studies, literature, and statistics, I can conclude that geography affects happiness through the hierarchy of needs. My first null hypothesis gave greater insight into international happiness, revealing multiple factors for satisfaction. My second examined the happiness of Houstonians surveyed in the workforce. To put it simply, money does not buy happiness once a person is able to satisfy basic needs and desires. And for my remaining question, I examined the moral responsibility of being a billionaire through contractualism and attributionism, both of which require an individual to obey societal obligations. For my remaining question, for my biblical connection, I examined Ephesians 2.10, which states, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The author of Ephesians, Paul, indirectly hints at the concept of self-actualization through the idea Christians are created in Christ for good works. Further, Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24, expand upon the idea of individual potential and the realization of one's best self. Striving to meet the needs of creation Paul sets forth, righteousness and holiness, is a task which takes a lifetime and will not be completed until the day of Christ. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, and are there any questions? All right, so Isabella, uh, we have a question from Emily, which asks, what factors did you find possess the strongest correlation to general happiness, and what advice can you give listeners about incorporating such factors into their lives? Emily, that's a great question. I would say it begins with the foundations of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which are basic needs. So once you fulfill, you know, hunger, water, shelter, you can then move on to your own needs as an individual. Um, those would be knowing yourself, knowing what you want to do in life, and finding your purpose so that you can seek it out and along the way find happiness. I think it's also important at some point to check in with your mental health and see if there are any possible deterrents in that area that um, could derail your search for happiness. Thank you. All right, then John asks, are people happier if their actions have more impact or less impact? That's a good question, John. Um, I can't say definitively. The World Happiness Index uses volunteer participation as one of the main metrics for gratitude. People who are happy often show gratitude in their actions, beliefs, and words, but it's not a defining factor of a happy person. Okay, and then Josh Chin asks, should uh, universal basic income be implemented in this? Well, it's not my place to say because I'm not an economist and I don't have a degree. I would say that there could be an argument for and against universal basic income. Should a person have the capacity to provide for their own basic needs? Maybe. Should they be given to them or should they seek it out for themselves? That's up for governments to decide. And then the last question, um, Gregory asked, uh, if you could expand on how ethical ramifications and moral obligations relate to geographical happiness. That's a good question, Gregory. Um, I would say that as religion and culture affect different geographic places, we would see different levels of eth ethical responsibility being implemented. Um, for example, countries that have signed the Paris Climate Agreement would then act more environmentally ethical than countries that hadn't. On the other hand, countries that have been influenced, influenced by um, extremist religions or atheism may react differently than more mainstream religions or more um, diverse cultures. So. Well, thank you, Isabella. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions right now. Thank you. All right, so while Ellie is getting set up, I just wanted to say that while tonight may seem all organized and prepared, um, which of course we had to because this is an important event, You'd be surprised what happens when 14 scholars and faculty members uh, travel to a country 4,000 miles away and do something as simple as riding the tube. 
Um, if there's one lesson I think that we can all learn from going on a London trip last summer, it would have to be that the tube is a cold machine that preys on an individual's hesitancy. Because um, when you hesitate even for one second, uh, the next thing you'll hear is, mind the gap, and then you watch the doors close. Uh, not forever, but for about five minutes until you reach the next station. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, we did get stuck on the tube. Um, and Ellie seems to be set up, so uh, I'm going to introduce her next. And boy, is she involved in a lot here. Ellie is our student body president. She's also involved in HC Theater Works and is a D group leader. She also played varsity volleyball, was a member of our robotics team, and just like Isabella, Ellie was involved in restoring justice as both a mem as both a board member and a leader at Youth for Justice. Next year, Ellie will attend Harvard College to study political science. And even though Ellie got into Stanford, Yale, and Harvard, she somehow got waitlisted at Wake Forest. Way to go, Deacons. Ladies and gentlemen, Ellie Ashby. Hello, my name is Ellie Ashby, and I am a member of the Scholar Class of 2020. And today, I will be discussing disagreeability, the word that finally allows you to justify being a jerk to others. Last year, I found disagreeability to be the psychological trait encompassing the behaviors of antagonism, sarcasm, and the instinct to go against the grain, to not care about what other people think of you. Disagreeable people and their actions can be seen throughout nearly all aspects of life, the economy, social movements, literature, artwork, mathematics, the list goes on. The malleability of disagreeability and its relation to both math and the economy prompted the following question. What is the neurology, psychology, and sociology of being disagreeable? And what are the factors that influence and construct it? What is its relationship with mathematical sociology and human behavior? And how does this relationship impact the economy, specifically in regards to the workforce and stock market? Disagreeability correlates with intelligence and creativity from a neuroanatomical standpoint. And the manifestation of disagreeability reveals itself in various ways throughout adolescence and adulthood. Mathematical sociology and its evaluation of social systems is seen in the Markov chain, which allows human behavior and personality to be interpreted mathematically. Behavioral patterns of disagreeable individuals have been observed using this method of analysis, and these insights are then translated into aspects of the economy, such as the workforce and stock market. Intrinsic success is found to correlate positively to disagreeableness, and those who are disagreeable are found to better express their innovative ideas. Maverick workers tend to be unorthodox, disagreeable, and more successful from a mathematical standpoint than an agreeable employee. In addition to this, disagreeable women and men are treated differently in the workplace due to a societal stigma against disagreeable women. And finally, disagreeability acts as a catalyst of change in the stock market, seen in the idea of pulling the goalie, meaning those who go against the grain and take a financial risk often have a higher likelihood of a positive outcome in situations of financial turmoil. To further study disagreeability and its relation to the workforce and human behavior, the scholar decided to test two null hypotheses and conduct a descriptive case study. The first and second null hypothesis were tested by conducting an unrestricted online survey, which was sent to Houston Christian High School in addition to being shared on other social media platforms. 215 Houstonians responded to the survey. The first null hypothesis reads, when presented with an ethical dilemma, Houstonians choose the option that offers the greatest likelihood of a positive outcome rather than the option that conforms to societal norms. All respondents were asked how they would respond in two different ethical dilemmas. The first one was the classic trolley problem. Would you rather be a bystander on a trolley and let five people die in the process? Or would you rather forcibly change the tracks to avoid the five people, but kill one person on purpose? In other words, would you rather be agreeable and be a bystander or be disagreeable, change the tracks, and receive a better outcome? 
87.4% of all Houston respondents reported that they would rather change the tracks than keep the trolley on its current path. The majority of people acted disagreeably, for they opted to choose the option with the greatest likelihood of a positive outcome, disregarding the negative effects of killing one person on purpose. This resulted in a p-value of one. The second ethical dilemma read, you are a doctor with five dying patients. You have the ability to kill one person and use that person's organs to save five others. What do you do? 58.1% of all Houston respondents reported that they would rather let the five patients die than kill the one person to save them. The majority of people here acted agreeably, for they opted to choose the option conforming to societal norms, which is to embrace the ethical decision following the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, rather than be disagreeable and save five people in the process. This resulted in a p-value of 0 0.008. Because one p-value was under 0.05 and the other was above, the null could not be completely rejected and is liable to further evaluation under specific circumstances. However, interesting findings arose. Ethical decision-making and its correlation to disagreeability appeared to be dependent on the severity of the ethical issue presented. The more controversial an ethical dilemma, the less disagreeability was used as a tool of reasoning. The trolley problem is a simple, standard ethical dilemma, so people found it easier to go against the grain and make a disagreeable choice. But the medical problem introduced a new variable. To be disagreeable, you would have to go against a set precedent, the Hippocratic Oath. It is much harder to go against the grain when more variables of life are introduced. The second null hypothesis reads, it is more advantageous for Houstonian women to be disagreeable in a workplace setting than it is for Houstonian men. 53.3% of all Houstonian female respondents self-identified as disagreeable, as did 55.1% of all Houstonian male respondents. All respondents were asked four questions regarding a person's number of promotions, salary level, job position, and occupation. Certain responses qualified as being advantageous or showing occupational success. Certain aspects of success correlated more with disagreeable men than disagreeable women. For example, disagreeability was an advantageous trait to men in the position of executives. In the survey, disagreeable men correlated more with the advantageous traits than disagreeable women did. However, while disagreeable men had the higher percentage, the difference between men and women was not enough to result in a p-value under 0.05 each time. Because of these differing p-values, the null could not be completely rejected and is again liable to further evaluation under specific circumstances. The scholar's descriptive case study was a study of Dr. Brene Brown and her disagreeable theory on vulnerability and courage. To further analyze this idea, the scholar read and listened to the works of Dr. Brene Brown and divided this research into three categories. A time Brown was disagreeable and it worked or failed, a time Brown's ideas were disagreeable, and a time someone else was disagreeable in Brown's research. From this research, the scholar found that Brown did not start off as a disagreeable individual, but sees the action of being vulnerable as counter to the current tough it up culture of America and as the healthiest way to live, love, parent, and lead. Brown sees shame as the instigation of most unhealthy emotional behaviors and vulnerability as the cure for this. It is through the healing of difficult conversations that emotional reconciliation is found. Even though emotional suppression is seen again and again to bring nothing but momentary relief instead of long-term rehabilitation, society still follows this path instead of making the more difficult decision the decision and mindset Brown advocates. Disagreeability and disagreeable individuals make up the forefront of societal change, which prompted the following question. How did psychological and sociological factors influence the instigation of the Renaissance and Enlightenment and the downfall of the church? During the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church was the center of Western European society. However, it was overrun by corrupt clergymen and popes. 
Martin Luther, a German monk during the 16th century, noticed the rigidity and the corruption of the Catholic Church and decided to embrace ideas similar to humanism, a new cultural movement, to recenter the church. Humanism ignited the rebirth of personal and private thought within Western European society. Luther applied ideas similar to this to Christianity and wrote the 95 Theses. The 95 Theses offered a disagreeable or newfound understanding of the gospel, one focused on a personal relationship with God, the existence of an individual conscience, and the undeserving grace of God, rather than the corruption and the rigidity of the church at the time. Before Luther, Christian artwork was stagnant, linear, impassive, and cold. But after the instigation of the theological reform by Martin Luther, art was transformed. Luther's emphasis on personal expression within Christianity led to the application of such within paintings and artwork, causing Christ and other figures to embody emotion and romanticism. Paintings also became more realistic during this time due to the blending of the artistic and scientific communities. Scientists and artists during this time began to dissect people to better understand anatomy and create more realistic figures. The act of dissection was incredibly disagreeable at this time. However, it allowed art to reach a previously unseen degree of excellence and quality. It also allowed science to reach new heights, instigating both the Age of Enlightenment and secularization. Before this time, artwork was commissioned solely by religious bodies. Secular artwork was non-existent. But the growing cultural and societal movement allowed artists to break this mold. Art soon became the medium in which citizens of the Enlightenment professed disagreeable beliefs and philosophies counter to the church. Secularization was fueled by experimentation, reason, and logic, creating the scientific revolution a movement initiated by scientists and philosophers like Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton. The combined nuances of both the scientific revolution and Age of Enlightenment led to a gradual decline of the traditional church, the origin of atheism, an advance in humanism, and the belief in freedom as a fundamental right. The movements of this time were incredibly disagreeable and they were fueled by the disagreeable actions of many renowned individuals, such as Michelangelo, Botticelli, and Martin Luther, allowing us to live in the widely secular society we see today. In conclusion, disagreeability is both a psychological trait and a sociological phenomenon that can be viewed through the lens of mathematical sociology, the economy, and times of societal disruption. Disagreeable individuals have a unique set of characteristics that make them into a maverick worker, but people who make disagreeable decisions also embody disagreeability and have a higher rate of success than their agreeable counterparts. The scholar also tested two null hypotheses and conducted a descriptive case study to further investigate disagreeability. And while neither null hypothesis could be unequivocally rejected, interesting findings arose from the investigation and the case study provided insight into a disagreeable idea. In addition to this, disagreeability can be thought of as the instigation of sociological change, as seen in the Renaissance and Enlightenment. Actions counter to the Roman Catholic Church brought about the reforms and innovations we enjoy today. And finally, biblically, I connect this to Matthew 23, verses 27 through 28, which makes the argument for Jesus being a disagreeable figure. The Pharisees and religious officials at this time determined the societal norms, but Jesus made a point to break all of these. And Jesus' actions clearly disrupted the existing societal norms, as his existence and teachings are still discussed 2,000 years later. Thank you, and are there any questions? All right, Ellie. So Ms. Pearson asked, is it more socially acceptable for males to be disagreeable than females? That is an awesome question, Ms. Pearson. So I kind of looked at this in my uh, research paper, and so I talked about this in my previous presentation last uh, year. But what I found is that currently right now, there is an advantage to being a male who is disagreeable and opposed to being a female who is disagreeable. Uh, currently, I do think our society is straying away from this more and more, which is amazing. 
But I think currently the idea of a disagreeable person is seen as commanding and dominant, which are usually associated with characteristics of a very strong and hardworking male, not as much a female. So I think currently that societal stigma still exists. And I think that disagreeable women are at a disadvantage in that way. But I do think the tide is shifting, which is amazing. Um, and I do think it is becoming more socially acceptable for women to be disagreeable and put their ideas forth and kind of go against the grain um, in that sense. Okay. And then Lena asks, can disagreeability be gained in the workplace? Or is it, is it determined by someone's nature? That is an amazing question. Um, so there's kind of two realms of disagreeability. The first one is an inherent personality trait that a person has. So this cannot be changed. You are, it's your personality. And then there's a second kind of area of disagreeability where you as an individual can choose a disagreeable action based on your surroundings. So if you know the environment and the people that you're with are going one way, such as in a workplace, uh, you can decide to go the other way. And that can be you making an inherent decision to be disagreeable. And so there is a way to be disagreeable even if you have a rather agreeable personality. So there are ways to kind of increase your disagreeability in a way. And then uh, uh, Ms. Walshheimer asked, uh, how, does disagreeability change when uh, there's like an authority figure present? I think so. I think one interesting thing about disagreeability is that it's kind of determined on your environment. And so the leader of a certain place definitely uh, has an effect on whether or not you're disagreeable. If you agree with the leader, you're more likely to not go against what that person is saying. But if you disagree with that leader, um, it is more likely that you will go against it. So again, it's very subjective um, on the situation. But sometimes people are just disagreeable and kind of go against what anyone says, no matter if they agree or disagree. Uh, but yeah, it depends on the situation most of the time. So the leader as well. And then last question from Dean. Have you found a culture in which being disagreeable is celebrated and acceptable? And if so, what are the traits of that culture that make disagree disagreeability more acceptable? That is an awesome question, Dean. Um, I think that disagreeability is more accepted in a culture that is more willing to talk about certain things that have gone in the dark. You see people kind of go against the grain and start social movements when there's not a lot of conversation about an underlying issue going on. And so that's how a lot of our social movements have started, the civil rights movements, uh, the period of Renaissance. Um, you see people standing up and fighting against kind of an underlying culture or a societal norm. So I think that there is a way I think in a society where people are really open about having conversations about stuff that has gone, gone untalked about for a long time, that disagreeability can be seen as a really good thing because it's being seen as proactive and innovative and really seeking social change. All right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. And so just a couple fun facts for you before uh, Taylor presents uh, our last presentation tonight. It, it would be uh, good to note that Matthew Lollinger actually is a star athlete, specifically a kickball player, which we learned at a, our DSP picnic last year. And if you knew Matthew really well, you knew that you wouldn't really associate athletics with Matthew's personality. Um, but I just thought that'd be good to know. And also, Isabella has been dating uh, Cam Bam City for the last, how many months? Ten. For 10 months. So you should wish them congratulations on that. And for our last presenter of the night, I'm gonna introduce Taylor Allen. At Houston Christian, Taylor is a vice president on our National Honor Society. She's also an editor on our yearbook staff. She's the president of our Model United Nations Club and also a D group leader. Next semester, Taylor will be attending the University of Texas at Austin to double major in plan two and biology with a minor in core texts. Well, that's a mouthful. And rumor has it that Taylor's spirit, school spirit is so strong that even her hair is burnt orange. And I'll be sure that you'll notice that when she presents. So ladies and gentlemen, for the last presenter of the night, Taylor Allen. Hello, my name is Taylor Allen, and I'm a member of the scholar class of 2020. Today, I will be discussing the role of epigenetics in cancer development and its impact on funding, my original research, and the potential of stem cells in medicine. Over the past 50 years, scientists have discovered a great deal about cancer. 
It is the proliferation of abnormal cells, driven by mutations to tumor suppressor genes, which prevent a cell from becoming cancerous, and oncogenes, which, once activated, cause a cell to become cancerous. Recent advances in cancer research have also shown epigenetic changes play a considerable role in cancer development. Usually caused by environmental influences, epigenetic changes work by either stopping or promoting gene expression. In order to visualize epigenetics in terms of cancer, think of the cell as a car with the final destination being cancer. The removal of an epigenetic mark from an oncogene is akin to hitting the accelerator, promoting cancerous behavior. The addition of an epigenetic mark to a tumor suppressor gene deactivates the brakes, inhibiting the body's natural defense mechanisms against cancer. When combined, the cell arrives at a cancerous state. This led me to ask, what role does epigenetics play in the development of cancer? And how does cancer therapy impact research and funding? Epigenetic changes play a role in carcinogenesis in breast, lung, and colorectal cancer. BRCA1, the gene most commonly associated with breast cancer risk, is a tumor suppressor gene that is epigenetically deactivated during cancer development. Smoking, a prominent carcinogen in lung cancer, causes detrimental epigenetic changes and stimulates irregular gene expression. Diet, which is thought to be responsible for 80% of colorectal cancer cases, can epigenetically lead toward cancer, especially when one consumes more than three alcoholic beverages a day. However, while we are in quarantine, no one will judge you if you do this. Public perception of cancer development and whether a patient is responsible for their disease contributes to funding inequalities among cancer types. Funding disparities are evident in breast, lung, and colorectal cancer. Despite having five-year survival rates of 90%, 18%, and 66%, each cancer receives $60 million, $30 million, and $31 million, respectively, in specific funding in 2018. The epigenetic nature of cancer and the heritability and longevity of epigenetic marks means some detrimental environmental influences are beyond the patient's control. For instance, people who smoked in their teens may get lung cancer in their 70s, while overweight people may have inherited a susceptibility to obesity due to their parents' choices. Overall, cancer survival rates directly correlate with funding. And in order to verify the research found in the review of related literature regarding this issue, I conducted two null hypotheses and a case study. In terms of demographics, all of the respondents in my null hypotheses electronic survey were adults living in the United States. 76.8% of respondents were women, with 67% possessing a bachelor's degree or above. The majority of respondents had a close friend or family member who suffered from breast cancer, lung cancer, or both. A slight majority had a close friend or family member who passed away due to breast cancer, lung cancer, or both. My first null hypothesis reads, the majority of adults believe breast cancer is caused primarily by environmental factors. 89.6% of respondents stated they believed breast cancer was caused primarily by genetic factors, not environmental ones. With a p-value of approximately zero, I was able to reject my first null. My second null hypothesis reads, the majority of adults believe lung cancer is caused primarily by heredity. 87.7% of respondents stated they believed lung cancer was caused primarily by environmental factors, not genetic ones. With a p-value of approximately zero, I was able to reject my second null. 
For my case study, I conducted a participant observational study on myself to determine the psychological impact of working in an oncology lab. I worked in a Baylor College of Medicine breast cancer research lab this past summer. During my time in the lab, I processed breast cancer tissue samples, created cancer cell lines, and harvested tumors and organs from mice used to test cancer drugs. While I received proper training, I soon became very anxious about the presence of cancer in my own life as I regularly worked with carcinogens and fresh tumors. Additionally, I became